Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be doing an overview for the topics in the AP Biology curriculum related to biotechnology. Now this is just a small section of Unit 6 of the entire AP Biology course and exam description, but it's a section that a lot of students struggle with or feel that they're not prepared for. So we're going to go through all of the topics that appear in the biotechnology topic so that you're prepared to better understand these for class or for the AP Bio exam. Let's get started. So one of the main goals of this topic is to explain the use of genetic engineering techniques in analyzing or manipulating DNA. There are so many different techniques within the realm of biotechnology. If you ever take a course in biotechnology or go on to study more biology, you'll find this out. But there's a few that are focused on in AP biology. These are PCR, gel electrophoresis, DNA sequencing, and bacterial transformation. All of the smaller details of how to do each of these techniques is beyond what the exam is actually going to test you on. As long as you have a good conceptual understanding of each of these techniques, you should be in a good place for the AP Bio exam. Now we're going to focus mostly on PCR, gel electrophoresis, and genetic transformation today because DNA sequencing is not covered very frequently on the exam and it's changed so much from the days of Singer sequencing all the way up to next-gen sequencing, which a lot of scientists use now, that you really don't need to get into the details of this for AP Bio. Basically, what you need to know about DNA sequencing is that it's the process of determining which nucleotides come in which order in a sample of DNA. Now we can do this at a much lower cost, and we're able to sequence short pieces of DNA really, really quickly for study in modern labs. Sequencing an entire organism's genome is still a little bit tricky, but in the future we may have the ability to sequence every individual's complete genome in order to personalize and tailor medicine towards them. But that is a topic for the future. Let's get back to PCR. So the main idea of PCR is making lots of copies of DNA from a small sample. With PCR we can make a lot of copies in a relatively short amount of time. What you need to know about PCR is that there are special machines that you can put your DNA sample after preparing it into, and then those machines go through through cycles to do these three things. First, it heats up the DNA, which denatures it or separates it into two different strands. Then we're gonna cool a little bit to 55 degrees Celsius and primers, which have been added to our DNA sample, which are these short fragments of DNA, will be able to anneal or connect to the separated DNA fragments. From there, we're gonna heat it up a little bit more so that we have more of an affinity for elongation. More nucleotides, which are floating in our mix, can attach to the open fragments of our DNA. So after one of these cycles, we're gonna get two new strands of DNA then it goes through the same process again. They're denatured or separated, we have our annealing process, and then we have our elongation. And you see how each time we're able to double the amount of DNA. So PCR just stands for polymerase chain reaction, and we'll do this over and over and over again until we get enough copies of our DNA. After that, we can use this DNA to do a multitude of different things. One very popular use is getting a DNA fingerprint or doing gel electrophoresis. Now, hopefully in your ninth grade biology class, you learned that this is not a fingerprint actually from your finger, but instead it's a particular pattern of your DNA after we run it through a gel. The first step in gel electrophoresis or getting a DNA fingerprint is gonna be cutting that DNA with restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are special enzymes that cut DNA at specific recognition sites that are usually only a few base pairs in length. Sometimes these are palindromic, meaning they read the same forwards and backwards, but after that cut is made, we'll get what's called sticky or blunt ends at the edges of our DNA. And a sticky end is when we have bases that are unpaired after a cut. So let's see what that means. So we'll have our sequence of DNA. The restriction enzyme will recognize a specific sequence and cut along that site to give us two separate fragments of DNA. For example, BAMH1 cuts our DNA between the two Gs in this sequence whenever it encounters it along the strand. After we've prepared our DNA by cutting it with restriction enzymes, then we can put it in a gel. Our gel is a matrix-like material with tiny little holes in it that's gonna allow our DNA to travel through it. Usually we put a marker or a sample of DNA that we know the exact fragment lengths of in the very first well, which is at the top of our gel. And then the other DNA samples that we're analyzing are gonna be loaded into the next wells, usually with a dye, and we're doing this with a micropipette. Once we've loaded all of our samples in, what we'll do is we'll attach electrodes. So we're running charges. Up here, this is a negative charge, and down here, this is a positive charge. One very important thing to remember about the properties of DNA is that DNA is negatively charged. So if we run an electric current through this gel, DNA will, will start to travel towards the positive end. But remember, in each of these samples, we've chopped our DNA up. So as it travels down towards the positive end of our gel, we're gonna see the DNA start to separate because each of these fragments is actually a different length. 
Our marker here is used for estimating the size of our DNA, but one thing we know for sure is that as the DNA travels down the gel, the longer fragments or the larger ones are going to stay closer to the top or closer to the wells, and the smaller fragments are going to be able to travel farther down the gel. So when the electric current is applied, the negatively charged DNA is going to move towards the positive end of the gel. But in each sample, each of these fragments are going to be different lengths, so we'll see different bands for the separation of the DNA molecule. One way I like to remember this is that if you have a race between one really, really large, probably out of shape person and one really, really tiny, pretty nimble, fit person, the person who is smaller is going to be able to run faster and win the race. And so that is what this DNA is doing. They're able to get through all of these holes in the gel faster because it's a smaller fragment and a smaller piece. You should be able to know the closer this is to where the wells are, the larger it is, the closer our DNA is to the positive end of our gel the smaller it is. So now that we know we can separate DNA based on size, what can this help us with? Gel electrophoresis has a lot of purposes, from DNA analysis at a crime scene, paternity testing, looking at how closely two organisms are related evolutionarily, but let's back it up to a crime scene. If we have, for example, our evidence from the crime scene, which is DNA, and we want to compare it to our suspects that we have in our case, what we can do is look at the banding pattern or the bands from the evidence DNA and compare that to the bands of the suspects. Based on these banding patterns, we can see that suspect three is a really good match with our evidence and we might have just solved the crime. We'll also use restriction enzymes and gel electrophoresis when we're doing genetic transformation. And what we're doing with genetic transformation is inserting a gene of one organism into another organism so that it can display a new trait. Because of the central dogma, we're able to do this because virtually all organisms use the same universal genetic code. A lot of times we'll do this back with bacteria and plasmids, but what is a plasmid? A plasmid is a circular double-stranded piece of DNA that's usually found in bacteria. It's extra chromosomal, meaning it doesn't belong inside the bacteria's chromosome, but bacteria will express or produce proteins from the DNA in these plasmids, and they'll replicate the plasmids whenever that bacteria divides as well. We use genetic engineering in a lot of fields, including agriculture, for example, inserting genes for pest resistance or fungal resistance into certain plants, in bioremediation, where we've genetically engineered bacteria to uptake oil at oil spills, or even in gene therapy in medicine. We've even used bacteria to produce insulin for humans before. So how do we get an organism like bacteria to actually express a new trait that wasn't in its DNA before? Here we're looking at a sample of DNA that's been added to bacteria to make it glow green. So a very simple version of this is that we start with a plasmid and we're gonna cut it with that restriction enzyme. Our foreign DNA or our DNA from the other organism is gonna be cut as well. And then those sticky ends will attach to give us recombinant DNA here, meaning DNA from one organism has taken up DNA from another, and DNA ligase is gonna join our sticky ends together to form our recombinant plasmid. Once we have a recombinant plasmid, we'll go through several laboratory techniques to make this bacterial cell competent, meaning it'll take up that new plasmid, and once it does, we say that it's transformed. Now after that, we're gonna give this bacteria a little time to grow and reproduce so that we can see actually on plates whether or not it actually took up that gene successfully and was able to pass it on as it replicated and divided. A lot of times we'll do this by adding a resistance gene. So for example, ampicillin is an antibiotic that kills off bacteria. So if the bacteria doesn't have a gene of resistance in it already, it will not grow or it will die on the plate. So you might see a chart like this. Charts like these are very common when we, when we talk about experiments with transformation. But the idea is that we'll set up several different plates and with one set of bacteria, our control, we won't add the ampicillin resistant gene. In another set of bacteria, we will transform and we will add an ampicillin resistant gene to it. Then we'll wait for the bacteria to grow and see what happens. On some of these plates, we've added ampicillin, the antibiotic that kills bacteria. On some of these plates, we haven't added any ampicillin. So this normal bacteria that we haven't changed should grow on the plate with no ampicillin because nothing's killing it. And it shouldn't grow on the plate that does have ampicillin. And so this shaded in color here just means there's a bacterial lawn, which just means bacterial growth that covers the entire plate. Now let's look at the genes that we did the transformation on. For our bacteria that we actually added the new ampicillin resistant gene to, on the plate with no ampicillin, we should still see a lot of growth. On the plate with ampicillin, we're gonna see growth too. 
it may not be as much as the plates without ampicillin because not all of the bacteria successfully transformed, but the ones that did are gonna be the ones that grow and show up on our plates. So here, even though we have the bacteria killing drug, if the bacteria successfully took up this ampicillin resistance gene, it should be able to grow here on this plate and that's what we see. So there's a lot of different versions of charts like these whenever we're doing tra transformation experiments with bacteria, but just be able to recognize when we're adding in genes, you should be able to hypothesize what should show up where and justify why we have growth on certain plates like these. I hope this has given you a good overview of some of the biotechnology techniques that are used and referred to in AP Biology. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you later.